February 9th, 2004. Haverhill, New Hampshire. On a snowy night on the New Hampshire and Vermont border, a single vehicle car crash would take place on Route 112 in Haverhill, New Hampshire. What on the surface would not seem, not totally out of the ordinary, would be anything but. Shortly after the accident, a bus driver pulled over to investigate the crash and asked the single female occupant if she was okay. She would reply that she was okay and that he did not need to call the police as AAA was already on their way. Although, this would be the last time Moore Murray was seen or heard from. Today on Unlearning the Unknown, we investigate one of the most infamous vanishings of all time on the heels of the event's 20th anniversary, where her family, investigators, and everyone involved with the case is no farther along in solving the mystery than when they started. What happened that fateful night? What drove Moore Murray up to this part of New Hampshire? And what was the series of events that led up to this night? Today we delve into a realm of uncertainty, mystery, and possibly one of the most talked about mysteries of the modern age. Today, the disappearance of Moore Murray. Welcome back to Unblurring the Unknown. As always, I am your host, Dominic, and today's episode is diving back into the true crime realm. Now, there's probably a good chance that you have heard of this particular case before, and anyone who lives within New Hampshire or along the state lines has probably heard the name Maura Murray before. But even though I had heard her name, what I did not know up to this point was the story and what happened that night. She seemingly vanished from that roadway, never to be seen or heard from again. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, we are now past 20 years from when Maura Murray first vanished in 2004, and we are arguably no closer to figuring out what exactly happened that night. So today, my hope is to break down the events from start to finish and see where it leads us into discussing the whereabouts of Maura Murray. Now, it's important to add context as well to this story in that this was one of the first missing persons cases that spread like wildfire over the internet, and it led to an influx of people who really decided to dive headfirst into this and become, you know, quote-unquote armchair detectives, if you will. And with a variety of those quote-unquote armchair detectives doing very great work in terms of trying to put the puzzle pieces together, and then... While you had people doing that, you also had a lot of people who were spreading misinformation. And in doing my research for this, I found myself at an impasse a couple of different times with trying to sort through what actually happened, what was the actual story, and I feel like I put together a majority of the information that I found available to me, um... And I just wanted to put together the best possible insight as I could into this entire case. Um, so with that being said, this episode is probably going to be a little bit longer than what you might be used to from me. Um, but that is because, like I said, I wanted to put together as much information as I could. I wanted to turn over a lot of the stones that I could in terms of just getting all of the relevant information I needed to give you all a basic understanding of this case. Because this case goes so much deeper than what I'm about to tell you in today's episode. And you can go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole in terms of really any aspect of this case. So I hope to today to pretty much give you a basic insight and overview of this case start to finish. Now, before we dive into the disappearance of Mora and the days leading up to her disappearance, I think it's extremely important to tell you all about Mora and who she truly was. Mora was born on May 4th, 1982 in Brockton, Massachusetts, to Fred and Lori Murray. She was the youngest of the sisters in the family and had numerous siblings, sisters Kathleen and Julie, older brother Fred Jr., and a younger brother named Curtis. She grew up in the South Shore in the suburb of Hanson, Massachusetts. Her father was a medical technician and her mom a nurse. They would be what you might think as the normal, everyday, working-class family. Her parents got divorced when she was six, 
but was very close with her siblings, and that helped her through most of her young life. Now, Moore in school was not only very academically smart, but also a competitor, as she played numerous sports throughout high school. She played AAU basketball, and was also an exceptionally good cross-country athlete as well, having competed nationally at the U.S. National Scholastic Outdoor Championships in the Two Mile as a sophomore, in which she ended up getting 33rd in the entire country, and this was in 1998. Now, because of this academic success and athletic success, she was primed for a very good start to whatever field she wanted to study further. She graduated top of her class, and instead of having her pick at numerous schools, she decided to follow in her sister Julie's footsteps and go to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Mora attended school at West Point until her second year before she transferred to UMass Amherst to study nursing. She had realized that maybe the military wasn't fully for her. Now, now that we've gone over some kind of general information about who Mora was, I think it's very important as well to discuss the days leading up to the day she vanished, and I think that this kind of ties everything together and it gives us a better picture as to what was going on in her life up to this day. Now, obviously, I mentioned she was a very, she was very academically talented. She was obviously very athletic. She kind of had a lot of things going for her in her life, and she really set herself up for success. And I kind of want you to keep that in the back of your mind, just kind of, you know, the type of person she was. You know, she wasn't a, you know, she wasn't a delinquent by any shape or any means of the imagination. She was a very good student, and there was a lot of things about her that you will slowly find out are very questionable as to why she would have even disappeared with her life being in the shape that it was. Now, the sequence of days leading up to her disappearance are just as mysterious as the disappearance themselves, and we're going to discuss why. On February 5th, four days before her disappearance, Moore was working the night desk for campus security at UMass Amherst. Now, this job is pretty cushy in all forms of the imagination. It was an overnight shift where Moore got to do a lot of her homework over the shift, and you really just checked student badges who were coming into the dormitories. Now, while working that shift, Moore took the time to call her sister Kathleen at approximately 10.20 p.m. It wasn't uncommon for them to have phone calls together while Mora was working her her shifts. Kathleen and Mora talked for a while on the phone, and it mostly included a, conversations about troubles with men, as Kathleen was going through a disagreement with her fiancé at the time. Nothing about this seemed totally out of the ordinary. Approximately three hours later, Mora would start crying during her shift for unknown reasons. Her shift supervisor, Karen, would try her best to comfort Mora as she walked her back to her dorm at around 1.20 a.m. Mora never told Karen what was wrong, and she didn't tell her friends either about what had happened or what had even caused her to have this fit of crying or mental breakdown, if you will. Now, fast forward to two days later, February 7th. Fred, Mora's dad, had made the trip over to Amherst to go car shopping with Mora. The reason for this is that her current car, a 1996 black Saturn sedan, was in rough shape. This would be the same car that she would later be driving in when she disappeared, just for a little added context. The car at this point was reportedly only running on three cylinders, and according to Fred, probably wouldn't have made it through the entirety of the following week. That kind of motivated them both to go car shopping. Fred kind of felt like we might as well just get you a new car rather than trying to fix the Saturn. After car shopping, Mora, Fred, and a friend of Mora's went out to dinner. After dinner, Fred gave Mora free range to use his car, a new Toyota Corolla, for the evening if she needed it. Fred was staying at a nearby hotel for the night and was going to be leaving in the morning. Mora would take Fred's car for the night. Later that night, Mora would attend a small party on campus where she drank with her friends. Now, people who were at that get-together or party, if you want to call it, really kind of stay that it was a very kind of casual thing. There was only kind of a few people there. It definitely wasn't super large in scope. Now, at one point during this party, Mora told her friends that she wanted to return the car back to her dad that night, which didn't really make a whole lot of sense to her friends, 
because Fred was not expecting the car to be back until the morning anyway. So they kind of thought that this was odd, but they kind of didn't really think too much of it. Regardless of this, Mora at around 2.30 a.m. would get into the Corolla and start the drive to go and drop it back off with her dad at the hotel he was staying at. While driving on Route 9, Mora would crash the Corolla into a guardrail. Local police showed up on the scene. However, Mora wasn't charged with anything, and she got a lift to her dad's hotel. Now, on the surface, you would think, obviously, she was at a party. She was obviously drinking. That we know is a fact. Did the police have any reason to suspect that she was driving under the influence? Now, that would be something to take a wild guess that she probably could have been. And from what I could find, um, reports were kind of split on whether or not the police did a sobriety test at the scene of the accident. From what I found in doing my research is that they did not do a sobriety test at the scene of the incident because they felt like Mora was sober. Um, but kind of, again, keep that in the back of your mind. If anybody has the correct information to that or kind of a counter to that, feel free to let me know in the comments. Um, there's going to be a couple other instances like that throughout this episode, where I'm going to ask for some outside help with this too, because there's just so many different iterations of the story um, that have really kind of gotten spread around the internet over the past 20 years. Um, so again, keep the idea of this accident in the back of your brain as we continue through this episode. Now, Fred said that Moore was very apologetic about what had happened, and Fred consoled her about it being an accident, you know, mistakes happen, Fred wasn't fully, you know, upset about it whatsoever. Now, like I said, the reason I mentioned this accident is because this will kind of come around full circle back in theories. So, like I said, I just want you to keep this in the back of your mind for the time being. Now, Moore was drinking that night, and it would be a safe bet to assume, like I said, that she was probably slightly under the influence, but we don't know that for certain. Now, at 4.49 a.m. that morning, which would put us obviously on February 8th now, she would make a phone call to her boyfriend, William Rausch, who goes by Bill or Billy, but for the story's sake, we are just going to call him Bill. Now, she would make this call to Bill over her father's cell phone. Bill, who Moore met while at West Point, was currently stationed in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Even though there was a lot of distance between them, they reportedly still stayed close and saw each other as much as they possibly could. Now, Moore would talk to Bill over the phone about the accident she just had in her father's car, and Bill obviously tried his best to console her through the phone. However, Bill stated that he felt like there was more on Moore's mind that she wasn't sharing. Now, also, keep that statement in the back of your mind as kind of there's a lot of different little hints I want you to pick up on because they kind of all come back together in theories. Now, just a few weeks before this phone call, Mora had actually arranged to get a nursing job in Oklahoma so that she could be closer to Bill. Their relationship was close, with Fred Murray saying that they probably would have been ended up getting married, and with Bill Roush saying in an interview that they were quote-unquote engaged to be engaged. Now, I obviously wanted to provide that little context into Mora and Bill's relationship as I believe it does play a role in speculating why she would have left UMass Amherst in the first place, but we'll get into that later. Now, after placing a few phone calls and discussing with her father, Fred's insurance was going to cover the cost of the accident, so it seemed like all was going to be fine with really no issues. Fred had to leave Moore that day due to his job requiring him to travel to Bridgeport, Connecticut, so Fred rented a car and dropped Mora back off at her UMass dorm the night of the 8th. At around 11.30 p.m., Fred had called Mora to talk to her about picking up accident forms from the Registry of Motor Vehicles so they could fill out the insurance information. And Fred would go on to tell her to call him the following night of February 9th at 8 p.m. so that they could go over the information together over the phone. Now, this is where Mora's behavior would kind of take a turn towards the unusual, unusual side. And if you didn't kind of think that it already was a little weird with her crying and then crashing the car... It gets even weirder. Shortly after midnight of the 8th, Moore would go onto the internet and look up to directions to the Berkshires, 
And she would also look up directions to Burlington, Vermont and Stowe, Vermont on MapQuest.com. Now, obviously, during this time, car and phone GPSs weren't readily available, and I thoroughly remember as a kid my family using MapQuest to get directions to places, so this makes total sense. Albeit very odd for Maura to do so, obviously looking up directions to Burlington, Vermont, and Stowe, as she didn't really have a reason to go up there. Now, on February 9th, so this would be in the morning of the Febu of February 9th. I couldn't find an exact time this phone call took place, but we do know it was on February 9th. Maura would then make a phone call to Bartlett, New Hampshire in particular, to the Seasons at Atatash Resort. She had called Linda and Dominic Salamone, who were the runners of a condo at that property. Maura would be familiar with the Bartlett area and even stayed at the Seasons with her family before, but she had not stayed in this particular condo that she was presumably trying to rent from the Salamones. Now, the Salamones weren't interviewed until almost a year after Moore disappeared, and their recollection of how that phone call went was pretty foggy at best. Although they were certain Moore didn't book the condo, most likely because of how frequently it gets booked, with Linda Salamone stating that people book out months ahead of time, and even if Moore wanted to stay there, Odds are it was already booked out. Now, this phone call that Mora had with the Salamones lasted approximately three minutes. Now, later that day at 1.13 p.m., Mora would call a fellow nursing student. Now, what was said on this phone call remains unknown. And the student she talked to, I also couldn't find out the information for. However, there were split opinions on what this call was for. Private investigator John Healy suspects that the phone call was because Mora was trying to give away her scrubs to a fellow nursing student, where her family thinks she was merely returning some that she had borrowed. Now, to me, this is important, because if she was giving her scrubs away, that kind of implies her thought process was to try and run away, like she was completely done with school and was merely trying to get away for some unknown reason. If she was returning them, like she just borrowed them, that implies that she was just, you know, doing her good deed, like, hey, I'm heading out for a few days, I'm returning these for you, so I don't forget. So, if she was just returning them after borrowing them, like I said, this would probably mean that she would be coming back to school at some point, and like I said, was just trying to get stuff situated before she had left. At 2.05 p.m., Moore would make another phone call this time to 1-800-GO-STOW, which was a number people could call to book hotels or stays in the Stowe, Vermont area. Mora did not have any luck with this, however, as the system was not working. The 1-800-GO-STOW system was not working, and you could only hear voice recording prompts, and you couldn't actually schedule any bookings. So while making these series of phone calls throughout the day, and obviously we know now that Moore couldn't get through to the 1-800-GO-STO number. While she was doing this, and while she was making these this kind of frantic phone calls to all these different people, she sent an email to Bill that said the following, and I quote, I love you more, stud. I got your messages. But honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promise to call you today, though. Love you, Mora. Close quote. Now, she would end up leaving Bill a voicemail at around 2.18 p.m. as well. The voicemail said that she loved him, missed him, and that she wanted to talk, but didn't go into any more detail other than that. Now, while Maura was making these kind of series of phone calls and obviously emailing Bill, she had also emailed her teachers at UMass Amherst that she was going to be heading out of town for a few days and would not be in class due to a death in the family. However, this would end up not being true, as there was not a death in the family. It is uncertain why Mora made this lie. However, what is clear is that Mora intended to get away for an uncertain amount of time for an unknown reason. Now, what is known is that Mora also packed up a good chunk of her school belongings in her dorm. She packed up a lot of things together and even went to the extent of taking the art off the walls. It is clear she wanted to get away, but why? And that is what investigators are still stumped about. 
Although many people claim, including her family, that it would not be implausible to think that this stuff wasn't packed up, but rather waiting to be unpacked. UMass Amherst at this time had a welcome back week when kids were returning from the holiday time off at the end of January and into the first week of February. So it is reasonable to assume that she had been back on campus less than 10 days and probably through the business of her schedule had not fully gotten everything taken care of. After all, after attending West Point, her family said Mora was much more of a neat freak and having her belongings tediously packed together like that would not be uncommon. So... The idea of whether or not her belongings were packed together or waiting to be unpacked is kind of used from people who want to interpret the story in different ways. The people who want to interpret the story in the way like she ran away from school, her family, her boyfriend, she just ran away. They look at those items packed away in the box as, oh, she was trying to get away. Versus her family's like, no, 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 no. There's probably a good chance that she hadn't unpacked those boxes yet, and that's why they were still packed up in the first place, and that she wasn't trying to run away. However, again, all of this circles back in theories, of course. Now, before leaving campus that day, Mora had packed many essentials to bring with her, such as her toothbrush, floss, toiletry items, cell phone charger, college textbooks, a stuffed animal monkey given to her from her father, and a diamond necklace given to her from Bill. Now, it is around 3.30 p.m. on the 9th is when she would leave campus. She would get into her 1996 Saturn and start her drive. Obviously, this is the same Saturn that her father did not want her driving, as it was running on three cylinders. Now, 10 minutes later after she started her drive, she would later be seen from an ATM camera withdrawing money from that ATM. She withdrew $280, which was almost all of the money from her account. She would then make another stop this time at a liquor store. She would purchase a bottle of Baileys, Kahlua, vodka, and a box of wine. Now, the last recorded usage of her cell phone would come at 4.37 p.m. that evening when she checked her voicemail. Now, it is important to note that she did get the registry of motor vehicle forms that she needed for the car accident a few days prior. So she made the effort to stop and get these forms, or maybe she printed them off at school, or maybe she drove to the office and grabbed them, that remains unknown, but we know that she took the effort and took the time to get these forms. Now, obviously, this shows that she still intended to have communication with her father and her family, even though she was making this trip. Now, that is kind of the sequence of events that happened before Moore's disappearance, and what I'm going to go into now is... The disappearance, you know, where she was, what happened um, the night of February 9th. Now, what happened between when she was last on her phone at 4.37 p.m. and when she ended up lodged in a snowbank and kind of almost in a ditch a little bit too on Wild Amanusik Road in between Woodsville and Haverhill, New Hampshire remains unknown. However, before we go into the accident, I want to talk a little bit about why she was there in the first place. Now, after doing a quick Google search and doing some Google Maps digging, the fastest route to Burlington, which on the surface you could assume maybe was an intended destination, given that she had map quested directions there, is roughly 2 hours and 53 minutes. Now, to get to Burlington, Vermont from UMass Amherst, you pretty much stay on I-91 North and then get into I-89 North, and it's pretty much interstate the whole way. Now, if she was intending to go to Burlington, this just doesn't make sense. And if she was trying to go to Burlington, she was drastically in the wrong place. If you calculate the distance from UMass Amherst to Burlington, that has you taking Route 112, a.k.a. Wild Amanusik Road, that takes your total drive for almost three hours to five hours. Now, if her intended destination was Burlington, what would cause her to take this route in the first place? It just doesn't make sense. Now, I understand that this would be being 20 years ago, routes could change, but not a two-hour detour. And if she was going to Burlington, this would just completely stump your brain, right? However, another theory, and my personal theory, 
is that she was trying to get to Bartlett, not Burlington, as she was familiar with the Bartlett area. Now, this route would make more sense. Now, if you're saying, well, she map quested directions to Burlington and Stowe, why would she be going to Bartlett? Obviously, we know she tried to call, or she called the Salamones to try and rent a place in Bartlett. Whether or not she did, or whether or not she was going to try and find a spot, is kind of unknown. But maybe the printed out directions to Burlington and Stowe was a backup plan, in case she couldn't find anywhere in Bartlett to stay. Now, again, that is just merely speculation, but... Like I said, it would make sense for her to go to an area that she was more familiar with, but kind of out of the way enough to where she would have some peace and quiet for however many days she was deciding to be gone for. Now, if her intended destination was Bartlett, even these directions don't make all that much sense. Because if you look into it, no suggested routes on Google Maps would put you through Route 112, a.k.a. Wild Amanusik Road. The only way this would make sense, if she was going to Bartlett, is that she was somewhat already familiar with Route 112, with her trips to New Hampshire, with her parents, when they would come up and hike and vacation and everything like that. Now, Route 112 is the more scenic route compared to Route 302. Route 302 being the route that would most quickly put you to Bartlett, would also have you traveling through Littleton, Bethlehem, and then kind of down through and then into Bartlett. However, what we do know is that she took Route 112. Now, if, like I said, if she was going to Bartlett, we have to assume that she was taking Route 112 either because she had some previous knowledge or maybe she was just following road signs. We don't fully know on that. But Route 302 is the more traveled route compared to Route 112, so there's still kind of a question to why she was on that road to begin with. Now, we obviously don't know if she was going to Bartlett for certain either. We have no idea really where she was going because we she never made it there. Whatever her intended destination was, she never made it there. Now, Route 112 being the more scenic of the route would make the road kind of not as good compared to the more well-traveled road, and because of the kind of wintry conditions of that night, that probably might have not been the best move. But again, we really don't know where she was going because, as we know, she never made it to her intended destination, wherever that was. Shortly after 7 p.m. that night is when Moore would get into her accident that would send her off the road and into a snowbank. Now, the weather that night, as I previously mentioned a little bit, was moderate at best. There was snow on the roads, and the temperature hovered around 30s for most of the day, but it's safe to assume that the temps would dip down during the night into possibly, you know, the high teens, kind of 20s range. Um, so below freezing, if anybody is not familiar with temperatures and how cold it gets at night in New Hampshire, you're below freezing once you're in that 20s range, obviously. But it would dip down during night. It's still very cold if you're not prepared for it. Um, now... The Westman residents sat across the street from where the accident would take place. Now, the Westmans would call the Grafton, Sher Co Grafton County Sheriff's Department to report the accident at 7.27 p.m. Obviously, they saw Moore's car crash into the snowbank and kind of pulled off on the side of the road. So, like I said, they would call the Sheriff's Department and report this accident. Now, the Westmans couldn't come to an agreement about the description of the person they saw in the car with Faith Westman thinking it looked like a man smoking, whereas Tim Westman said it looked like a woman using a cell phone. At a different house near the scene of the accident lived the Morotes. Virginia and John Morot said they saw the car off the road with its hazard lights on and somebody walking around the outside of the car. Now, while the two sets of onlookers to the accident looked on, a bus driver had actually pulled up and stopped next to Mora's car. Now, the driver of this school bus, Butch Atwood, lived down the road from the Westmans and was coming back home after dropping kids off following a skiing trip. Now, Atwood had stopped his bus after seeing a woman walking around the car. He stopped and confirmed to police that this woman was indeed Maura Murray when he got questioned by police. When Atwood stopped to check on Maura, he said that she was clearly shaken up, but that she was not hurt and that he didn't see any blood on her at all. He said that she was cold and shivering, and that her hair was down. This might seem not 
totally out of the ordinary with her hair being down, but her family points to this as being a little bit odd as Maura often wore her hair in a bun because of her time at West Point. That's how her hair needed to be. So she kind of wore a bun traditionally. That's kind of how she always looked. And having her hair down was a little bit odd. Her family at least thinks so. Now, Maura had struggled to get out of her car because of her car being right up against the snowbank. Now, Atwood stated that there was much as two and a half feet of snow on the ground at this time. So it's safe to assume that the snowbank she probably hit was probably pretty large. Atwood had asked Maura if she would like him to get a hold of the police, but she refused and said that she had called AAA and that they were coming to handle it. Now, how Maura reacted to Atwood saying, oh, do you want me to call the police, is under some discussion and scrutiny. Atwood said that she just simply refused, that she didn't want to call the police, that she had AAA coming. Whereas a synopsis kind of published by the New Hampshire State Police painted the events more like Moore refused and pleaded for Atwood not to call the police, rather than just simply saying, no, I'm good, I have people coming. Now, Butch Atwood was skeptical about Moore's answer to the AAA to the AAA statement saying, oh, I have AAA coming, as the cell phone service in that area was terrible, and that kind of cast a doubt onto whether or not she actually called him, or called AAA, that is, with Butch Atwood later saying that he quote-unquote knew better, and that he knew that she didn't have cell service, and why she even lied that she called AAA kind of remains uncertain. Atwood, however, couldn't make her go with him. So, obviously, he had asked, Hey, do you want me to... Do you want to come down and, and stay in the house? Stay warm until somebody gets here to take your car? And Moore refused. Now, like I said, Atwood couldn't make her go with him. So, Atwood went down to his house just down the road. No, knowing that Mora most likely needed help, he called 911 as well, and he stood on his front porch as he made this phone call. He could see the road but not Mora's car. Now, Atwood had trouble connecting to a 911 operator, but when he did, he connected through to Hanover Regional Dispatch Center, which then alerted the Grafton County Sheriff's Department. This phone call was at 7.43 p.m. While Atwood was on this call, he did say that he saw numerous cars drive by, but did not recognize any of them. While Atwood went back to his house, Faith Westman said that she had saw the interior lights of the car turn on and off, and saw someone walk back to the trunk of the car, which we have to presume was Mora. Three minutes later, Haverhill Police Sergeant Cecil Smith arrived at the scene of the crash at 7.46pm. So this was approximately seven to nine minutes that had passed since Butch At Atwood had left Mora after speaking with her. When Sergeant Smith arrived on the scene, he noticed that Mora was nowhere to be found. Upon investigating the scene of the accident, Sergeant Smith found that the windshield was cracked, both front airbags were deployed, and the car had been traveling in the eastbound lane, had struck some trees, and had spun itself around. What he also found was the box of Franzia wine behind the driver's seat. He also noticed that, were, that there was a red liquid on the driver's side door and ceiling, as well as similar red spots in the road around the accident. It is assumed that these red spots are from the box of wine as it was damaged in the accident. Sergeant Smith also found a Coke bottle in the car with a quote-unquote red liquid with a strong alcoholic odor. The other bottles that Mora had bought at the liquor store before the trip were not in the car. Sergeant Smith found also numerous personal items in the car that belonged to Mora, such as CDs, the directions to Burlington Stowe, and a book she was reading about hiking stories in the White Mountains. Again, this isn't suspicious, as she had hiked numerous times with her family in the White Mountains, so this book, to me, seems not super out of the ordinary. What Sergeant Smith also found when investigating the accident was a rag stuffed into the tailpipe of the car. Now, this might strike you as odd, and that's because it kind of is. It's uncertain why Moore would do this. However, Fred Murray did say that she kept a rag in her emergency kit in the Saturn. So that obviously explains where the rag came from. 
Now, it is believed that the most likely explanation for why she put the rag in the tailpipe was to stop the smoke from coming out and to try and not attract any attention from the cops. That is the most widely believed theory. That, obviously, if you plug up where the smoke is coming from, maybe you're harder to, harder to spot in the nighttime. Now, people also attribute this as, oh, this could be an attempt of suicide. Now, obviously, that would not be the case. Obviously, if she was trying to kill herself with carbon monoxide poisoning, that would involve attaching a hose to the car exhaust and then leading it back into the car. Um, and that was not here, so that obviously doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Sergeant Smith obviously went to the Westman's home and the Atwoods to talk about what they had seen and told him what they had saw and while Moore was at the car, that is. Around 10 minutes later, EMS and the fire department would show up to the scene as well. Shortly after the accident, Sergeant Smith recruited Butch Atwood to help look for Mora as they believed, at this point, she had left the scene of the accident. They drove a loop around a nearby recreation area in the nearby Swiftwater General Store for approximately 15 minutes, according to Atwood. Now, Fred Murray states that Sergeant Smith drove westbound on Route 112 and didn't go eastbound. Obviously, if she was traveling eastbound, which it looks like she was, why you wouldn't search that direction first doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but that's just my opinion. At 8.02 p.m., EMS had cleared the scene, and by 8.49 p.m., the fire department had left as well, and Moore's car was towed to a nearby auto body shop. At 9.27 p.m., Sergeant Smith had to pull away from the scene as he was dispatched to another call in Haverhill. What Sergeant Smith did in terms of investigating from looking to Moore with Atwood, and then up to 9.27 p.m., I could not find. And I am not just going to go out into a limb and claim that he didn't look, because I feel like that would be kind of incorrect. You have to assume that he at least looked for her in some way. Now, it wouldn't be until the following day, February 10th, around noon, when the police had issued a be-on-the-lookout order for Mora and gave the public a description to work with. But just kind of keep that in the back of your mind for right now, because I'm going to come right back to it. Fred Murray would be called and left a voicemail at 3.20 p.m. on the 10th. He was working at his job and didn't receive this, this voicemail until much later. Now, around 5 p.m., the night of the 10th, is when Kathleen Murray, Mora's older sister, would call her dad, and Fred would pick up. Kathleen told Fred that Mora's car was left in New Hampshire and that she was missing. Once Fred heard this, he immediately called Haverhill Police Department and demanded that a search be launched to find his daughter, to which the police department replied with that if Mora was still missing come Wednesday, the following day the 11th, that the Fish and Game Department would launch a formal search. Now, if some of this seems fishy, from an investigative standpoint, it kind of does, and I want to go into that. Now, according to the Crime Junkies podcast, Sergeant Smith obtained a search warrant on Mora's car the following day after it had gotten towed, and that's when he discovered the car was registered to Fred Murray. And since the door of the car was locked when Sergeant Smith arrived on the scene, the contents of the car weren't fully identified until that following day. This part seems official and normal, however, it gets more odd. On the surface, when I first looked into this, a lot of things just did not make sense to me. Sergeant Smith had obviously checked with the nearby witnesses of the accident, and they all said there was someone at the car, and Butch Atwood gave a description on what Mora looked like. Now, it turns out Sergeant Smith did put out a be on the lookout order during the initial investigation. And remember when I said he, he put one out the following day, just a few seconds earlier, I just mentioned that? It turns out this first be on the lookout was pretty much spot on to what Mora looked like, and that she was on foot and fleeing the scene from an accident. Now, the description he gave of Mora was a pretty spot on guess to what she looked like. And... If you want to look at it that way, a guess, that's fine. The second be on the lookout order that was released the following day, the 10th, was not very accurate.
to what Mora looked like, describing her as shorter, with even a different hair color. Why this was the case, I have no idea, but nonetheless, pretty odd. Your first BL in the look order is pretty much spot on to what Mora looks like, and then your second B on the lookout order is drastically different. Now, I have no idea as to why this could be the case, but I digress. Now, it also turns out that before first responders had gotten to the scene of the accident, a witness who had remained anonymous throughout this entire investigation, who goes just by witness A, says that they drove by the scene of the accident pretty much a few minutes after Butch Atwood was there at around 7.37 p.m. and noticed a police SUV parked nose-to-nose with Morris car. Now, Sergeant Smith wouldn't get to the accident until almost 10 minutes after this. This would imply that either the cops got to the accident much earlier than they say they did, if what, witness, if what this witness A saw was what they really saw. Some armchair detectives put this up to the theory that there could be a greater cover-up going on with the police department that we don't know about, and that whoever was the police officer who had stopped with Mora before Sergeant Smith got there had done something to her, whether this be it on accident or on purpose, and then the department then covered it up. No, obviously, this is a juicy theory, and I will go into this in detail a little bit later. Now, I want to move into the search aspect of this case following the accident. Now, I'm not going to get super in-depth about every little detail of the search, because at the end of the day, she's still missing, and we have come up with nothing to this point as to where she possibly could be. When Fred and company got to New Hampshire to start looking, the fishing game conducted a search by helicopter, scent dogs were brought in, and search teams looked up and down the Kangamagus Highway. What was taken away from those two days of searching is that when a scent dog was brought in and took a smell of Morris scent, it tracked the scent down the road eastward to where Route 112 intersects with Bradley Hill Road and the dog then lost the scent. This implies that Mora left the scene of the accident for perhaps unknown reasons, to where she could have possibly been picked up, but that is not certain and just speculative. Now, when the news came out on the 10th about Mora's disappearance, her boyfriend, Bill Roush, was obviously contacted. Now, at the time, he was headed to the airport in Dallas, Texas when he got the call. He immediately requested a leave of absence to help search, which was granted. However, what remains a point of mystery is a phone call that Bill received shortly after he had shut his phone off to go through airport security. What was on that voice message wasn't anybody speaking, but rather what sounded like whimpers and labored breathing, like the person on the other end of the line was cold. Now, this voice message was traced back to a prepaid phone card, and Bill's mother, Sharon, said that she had actually gifted Mora some of these prepaid phone cards during the holidays prior. However, this prepaid call could not be traced to a location, and this incident was closed. However, I do think that this is a possible lead as to what happened to Mora. Now, during the investigation, many members of the police force investigating thought that it would be very possible that Mora disappeared on her own accord, given that she was obviously an adult. However, members of both the Murray family and the Roush family don't think that this was the case, and neither do I, quite frankly. The searching from family, friends, and law enforcement came up empty-handed. Fred was extremely frustrated with how the case was handled from the beginning. The Haverhill Police Department and New Hampshire police agencies did not even contact Vermont police that was just across the state border nearby. Vermont is obviously extremely close to where this incident took place and would well within be in range in case she got picked up or fled or for whatever reason. It would be safe to assume that she could have went over the border. Now, Fred was displeased with this as... He stated when he crossed into Vermont and started asking local police stations about Moore's disappearance, if they had seen anything, if they heard anything, they said that they had no idea what he was talking about and that they had no record of New Hampshire police ever contacting them or even reaching out that they had a missing person that they needed assistance with. And this obviously frustrated Fred considerably. Now, on a different note, as we're kind of covering little aspects of the search here. Nearly three months later, a local contractor named Rick Forcier 
came forward and said that he saw a rum, a woman running on Route 112 eastbound around 4 to 5 miles away from the scene of the crash at around 8 p.m. Originally, Rick misplaced what day it was and didn't come forward as he thought the day he saw the woman was a few days after the accident and kind of disregarded it. However, when going back through and checking his work planner, he realized that it did happen the night of the accident and realized that, hey, he had to bring this information forward to police and to Fred Murray. Now, this information, realistically, would drastically change the search area if, in fact, she was still in the woods. Now, while this was also going on, Fred thought that there could also be a connection with other unexplained disappearances in the area, such as one that took place in Montgomery, Vermont, which is about 90 miles north, and one in Manchester, New Hampshire. However, New Hampshire police were fairly confident in saying that they didn't feel like those cases were connected. But nonetheless, Fred Murray and the Murray family wanted to bring awareness to these disappearances and kind of the lack of effort, therefore, by New Hampshire authorities to even kind of not only investigate, but just do a lot of quality digging into these cases. And Fred Murray kind of used his platform to bring attention to these other disappearances as well. And now you could go down any rabbit hole you want to in terms of this case. And I addressed that in the beginning of the episode. And from the events that transpired in 2004 to now, over 20 years later, we really still don't have any answers. There have been people who have claimed to have seen a person matching Moore's description, sighted in both Vermont and New Hampshire following the years after her disappearance, but none of that's proven. There have been a few leads consisting of a cadaver dog hit on a nearby house's basement, which came up empty-handed, as well as the discovery of a body at nearby Loon Mountain, which ended up also not being Mora. There was also a man who came forward to Fred Murray with a knife that the man said the brother used to kill Mora the night she disappeared. The man said his brother had passed away at this point and had found the knife and had to turn it in. Now, I couldn't fully find a time on when this incident happened, when this guy turned the knife over to Fred Murray, um, but if somebody does have a time for that, please let me know. And Fred Murray took that knife and then gave it to the authorities and said, hey, this guy said, you know, X, Y, and Z, gave it to the authorities, and nothing has been heard about this knife since. So whether or not it's just been completely disregarded or if it's not a lead or if it's something kind of in between, we honestly have no idea. And at the end of the day, we certainly are no closer to finding Mora. And you could say that, like I said, you know, this is just scratching the surface of the whole mystery there is to unravel about everything start to finish that has taken place in this case. Um, however, what I do recommend, if you are interested in learning more about this case, is check out not only the website, more, moramurraymissing.org, but also Julie Murray's TikTok, where she breaks down big sections of this case and what law enforcement did, or more like what they didn't do during this kind of whole investigation process. And Julie Murray has also collaborated with putting out a podcast called Media Pressure, where she goes through everything about the case start to finish. I personally did not have the time to listen to all these episodes this week as I was just merely trying to pile together all this information and kind of just put an episode out for you guys. It's obviously going to be very much longer than what you might be used to. Now, I do plan on listening to all these episodes um, of the Media Pressure Podcast, and if I feel like there is a substantial amount of evidence that I left out from this episode... I will most likely circle back and cover this more in a part two, just so everybody has that information. So if you're saying, oh, Dominic, you left out all this information, more likely than not, I'm going to circle back and I am going to do more research into this. I just really, I strictly did not have all the time in the world, um, but I used all the free time I did have and just put all my eggs in this basket for this week. Um, so yeah, please check out all of those sources. Um, when you're doing your own investigation into this, and if you're trying to find more um, more information on this, just besides my podcast, of course. Now, I just want to go over some final thoughts before I kind of dive into theories, because this case has generated just a huge following throughout the internet, and, and it was mostly through the campaigning efforts of the Murray family. And the internet has had a field day with possible theories as to what has happened, some being very realistic, and some maybe not so much. 
That's why I'm going to put forward a couple theories that I think make the most possible sense. Now, in the beginning of doing my research, I got sucked into the idea as to why Mora would leave UMass to begin with, and that never fully made any sense to me. Something must have been going on in her personal life that caused her to want to leave campus for a few days, and we can kind of assume that for a fact, but what that is that was going on in her life, we just don't know. For the basis of my theories, I'm going to use perhaps the theory that makes the most sense as to why she came up to New Hampshire in that she was having a mental lapse and something stressful in her life was going on, whether that be serious trouble at school or maybe even a cheating affair that either her and Bill was involved in that a lot of people speculate was actually going on. Those seem to make the most sense to people, but obviously you can use one of the two in terms of the theories, but these theories are going to be solely off of why she disappeared, not why she went up to New Hampshire. Obviously, those are probably the two that I had. She was having some sort of mental breakdown incident and felt like she needed to get away for a few days, or maybe there was a cheating thing going on where she needed to not talk to Bill for a few days and kind of clear her mind. But with that being said, I'm going to dive into theories about why Maura Murray possibly disappeared. Now, the first theory is kidnapped. And this first theory is the one that the Murray family thinks happened. They think that while crashed on Route 112, somebody drove by, offered her a ride to wherever she was going to, and instead that person who picked her up kidnapped her. Given that it's 20 years, we have to assume the worst with this theory, but on the surface, it doesn't fully make sense. Only because when Butch Atwood had offered her a ride, she had made up the excuse of calling AAA, even though there wasn't any cell service. I would be hard-pressed to think that she would get into somebody else's vehicle willingly. If she was forced, that could be a different story, but I'm still hesitant. Obviously, we know missing from her car was her backpack, the booze, her cell phone, credit cards, and her car keys. She locked it, too. If someone had swiped her off of, from the scene of the accident, she wouldn't have been able to lock her car, let alone probably grab all that stuff that she took. Lastly, if she was trying to flee from the scene of the accident, heading down the road where Rick Forcier had his sighting, and then assuming she could have gotten swiped while she was running down the road, that kind of seems more likely. But again, the fact that nobody saw anything, that's also kind of a question mark. Now, our second theory being cop cover-up. And this theory hinges on the idea that there is some greater arching conspiracy at work within the police force to cover up her disappearance. And... I'm very split on how I feel about this theory, and don't get me wrong, I am thoroughly behind the idea that they dropped the ball big time. However, I know that the town of Haverhill during this time only had a full-time police force of only a few officers, but the reaction time of this entire incident was extremely slow, and the chief of the department and many of the officers fed the Murray family this idea that Moore ran away when the Murray family knew better than that. However, what we do know, and this is something that I had not gone over in the episode, but it's a little tidbit of information that I think you might find interesting. What we do know is that the chief of the Haverhill Police Department was later arrested for drinking and driving. So obviously the department was not without its flaws, but would that flaw consist of covering up a disappearance or possibly even a murder of Maura Murray? Again, total stretch, but that's why we have theories. Now, I think between the reaction time being basically negligent and New Hampshire police not notifying their neighbors over in Vermont and not taking the search seriously from day one is what set the investigation back. And if someone had just happened to go east along Route 112 instead of west, like both Sergeant Smith and Atwood did, we might have found her if she was on foot still at that point. However, we still don't have any answers for why the police SUV was parked nose-to-nose -nose with Moore's car that was seen from Witness A. That we still don't have any answers for. Do I think the police are covering something up? Maybe. And if they are, unfortunately, I don't think it's the sole reason for why Moore vanished. Now, the third theory might be, on the surface, the one that makes the most sense. But in a case like this, where it's had 20 years to pretty much develop and all these theories come out on the internet, this is kind of where it makes the most sense and it's the most down to earth. And that's why I call this theory Occam's Razor. Now, if you know anything about the phrase Occam's Razor, is that if you have multiple solutions to the problem, 
going with the simplest one is probably your best bet. So this being that this is quite simply the easiest theory to get behind, and it's the one that makes the most sense, and that you have... Once Mora had the conversation with Butch Atwood, she knew that he would most likely call the cops, giving her a very short period of time before they got there. With what Mora was going through mentally, and perhaps her being slightly intoxicated, because of obviously they, we have the Coke bottle that was found with what we can assume was wine in it, she knew she would be busted, and therefore had to explain to her parents everything that happened and what was going on in her in her life, what was going on with her emotionally, or maybe even worse, if it was something like Bill or herself having an affair, if you want to believe that. Mora was a strong girl, and was very accomplished in everything that she did. If she got caught, she would have a moment of weakness, and feel like maybe she wasn't good enough for her parents' approval anymore. Again, this is all speculatory, but I am going with this because this does seem to make sense. Now, Mora probably knew that whatever was affecting her mentally and everything that was going on, she couldn't tell her parents about it, but knew she had to leave for a few days and hope her parents didn't find out that she had left. Now, after Butch Atwood left Mora there on the side of the road, she ran down the road east towards where she was going, which I'm assuming was Bartlett. Obviously, we established that Bartlett was down the road, and it was a town that she was familiar with, and while going east, she must have tried to hide from oncoming cars or maybe even police cars to try and not get seen and unfortunately got lost. She was already cold when Atwood had stopped to check on her, so my unfortunate guess is that she succumbed to the elements. The only thing is I don't know where. But if you do any investigating into the into mysterious disappearances or even into the missing 411, you'll find that oftentimes in not, bodies will be found in areas that have been searched numerous upon numerous of times before anything's even uncovered. And this even goes on to explain the idea of the phone call that Bill received while he was in the airport. However, obviously that came from a prepaid card. We're not able to track that. You know, they kind of closed the book on that. They said it wasn't related. But it, it could be something. If you decide that this is probably the theory you want to go with, then maybe it makes sense. But again, even though this is the simplest theory and it makes the most sense, it's not what everybody buys into. Now, our fourth and final theory is that Bill could have played some part in her disappearance. And while I think this could be a reason as to why she felt like she had to leave campus, I don't think it accounts to her disappearing. Now, we know that Bill was in Oklahoma at the time of the disappearance, and I know officially he has never been fully ruled out as a suspect, which is something to obviously think about. However, in doing my research, I did discover that... Bill Rausch, who currently lives in Washington, D.C., was convicted of a third-degree sex abuse charge in 2022 when he inappropriately touched a co-worker while in the office. Now, obviously, this is a, a very long change in time from when these two instances occurred, but could he have done something inappropriate to Mora, and maybe that caused her mental state to decline? Who knows? But I don't think Bill contributed to her disappearance outright. However, I don't think I'd be fully shocked if they were having relationship problems and that contributed to how Moore was feeling at the time of this whole incident. Now, like I said, even though I don't think Bill was in New Hampshire and that was the cause of the disappearance, I just don't think that was possible, maybe relationship issues was probably one of the reasons that contributed to why Moore came up to New Hampshire in the first place. Now... As I've established before, I probably most likely missed some information in doing this research. And like I said, I plan to circle back and cover a lot of the information that Julie Murray is now putting out there for people to interpret. And my theory is, is Occam's razor. And unfortunately, I think we just haven't found her body yet. And I think it might be the generic theory. I might think it's, you know, the easy theory and... You could say, oh, well, Dominic, you go to the, the easy theories quite a bit. And that's only because it, it just makes the most sense in this instance. And I wish we had answers. I wish, you know, the New Hampshire police didn't drag their feet as much as they did. Um, whether or not there is a deep-rooted cover-up to keep this, you know, case kind of hush-hush within, 
you know, the police department. I don't know. That is all speculation, but people like to speculate. People like to, you know, throw a lot of these wild theories out there about what actually happened to Mora. And the fact that it's been 20 years and we arguably are not any closer as to when she first disappeared on February 9th, 2004 kind of adds to the allure and adds to the mystery as to why so many people decide to look into this and get so invested in this and so invested in the case because you have this family who has been through so much pain over 20 years and the only thing you want for them is justice to figure out what happened to their daughter and like I said it's been 20 years and we arguably are no closer so Unfortunately, even though my theory is what it is, we need to continue to keep our fingers crossed and pray that someday the Murray family gets answers as to what happened to Maura Murray. But with that being said, that is going to conclude today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Obviously, I went down the true crime route for this week, and I got super into this. Obviously, um, an emotional episode that is... If you do any sort of research in, it can be hard to research at times because you feel for the family. You feel for everything that everybody's been through. And, you know, that kind of contributes to the story and its entirety. But I really appreciate you turning in to this week's episode of Unblurring the Unknown. As always, at the end of the episodes, I do my obligatory plugs. So in case you are listening to this on Spotify, please turn on post notifications so you get notified every time I post a new episode. If you're listening to this on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe. It helps me out with the algorithm. I greatly appreciate it. And if you are not aware, I am also on Instagram under the handle Unblurring the Unknown. You can follow me on Instagram. I will be posting relevant photos to this week's episode as well as the episode's cover art for this week. So please check that out as well. And in case you are not aware, I also take topic suggestions through my email, and that is unblurringtheunknown at gmail.com. Again, I keep getting topic suggestions. Each week I seem to get one from somebody, whether it be uh, somebody sending me one or a coworker saying, oh, you should really look into this. I seem to keep getting them, and they keep adding to the queue. Um, So please send them over to me. I greatly appreciate it. But with that being said, that is going to conclude this week's episode, and I will see you all on the next one.